Hey everybody, it's Uncle John from Your Story Hour, and I'm here to bring you another chapter from Too Much Salt and Pepper by Sam Campbell. Today's chapter is chapter number six, and it is entitled The Way of Wild Hearts of Porcupines. If you wondered why it took me so long to read the number six, it's because it's in Roman numerals. And I had to think about it when I saw that. All right. So we're ready for, for chapter number six. Here we go. For Carol, the next few weeks in the city dragged along as if they were trailing an anchor. She tried to shorten that geological period between the accepted invitation and the day of her coming by writing letters. What should she bring? What should she wear? Did we suppose it was going to rain? At what time would her train arrive? And why couldn't it get there sooner? Who would meet her at the station? Could Salt come? <clears throat> what were we going to do the first day, the second day, and the other days? Could she learn to chop wood with a saw or saw it with an axe? She wasn't sure which was right. She wanted to swim, hike, climb trees, be on the go early and late. In fact, she designed a program of events that would have worn out a regiment of soldiers. She wanted to know all about her tent house, and her letter fairly squealed with excitement after our detailed description. We had no doubt of the wild and happy time we we were in for when that little tornado struck the sanctuary. Jenny expressed it well when someone asked her who our much-talked-of guest would, was to be. There will be about half a dozen people called Carol, she said, and so it proved to be. While Jenny and I were anxious for, Cheryl's, for Carol's coming, time did not drag at the sanctuary. Salt and pepper saw to that. Their resources for giving us problems were seemingly inexhaustible. Sometimes it was because of what they did. Sometimes what they didn't do. Sometimes it was that they were too much in evidence, and sometimes because we couldn't find them at all. Right now, they were preparing for us a new adventure, having it in pleasure with a bit of pain, a sweetness that was just a little sad. The old the poor old porcupine has never been thought of as having much affection for his kind, and in fact, for anything else. His supposed indifference and stupidity have been the joke and jibe of nature students. But in Inky, our solitary porcupine, we had come to find an ability to form a friendship which endured. In Salt and Pepper was a repetition of that friendship, but also living evidence of their devotion to each other. Sometimes the wild heart rings truer than our own. Numerous and gripping are the stories of devotion between creatures, often in odd combinations. On a Midwestern farm a few years ago, a collie dog struck up a friendship with a huge stray cat. The cat appeared about the barn, apparently intent upon staying. The dog was delighted, but not the farmer. Times were hard at this farm, <coughs> where there were many to feed. <coughs> and even one extra cat would be a burden. The cat remained for several weeks, mostly because of the insistence of the dog. But one day, old Tommy, as he had been named, was taken away to another farm several miles distance, where an overpopulation of rats and mice offered him considerable employment. Yet the cat found no contentment at his new home, and spent most of his time meowing his loneliness. The collie dog back at the other farm became despondent. He refused to eat, spending all his time searching for old Tom. One day, the dog disappeared. He was gone for several days, and then reappeared, trotting happily up the roadway, old Tommy beside him. It was an experience which touched the heart of the farmer. Nevertheless, old Tommy was taken back to the second farm once more. Again, the collie retrieved him. Then, in desperation, the farmer took old Tommy to a third par farm about six miles away. It was a larger problem for the collie this time, but he was equal to it. He was gone for over a week before he returned with the old Tommy trotting by his side. The farmer gave in then and old Tommy was allowed to stay, much to the delight of the collie and himself. At the home of a friend of mine, I saw a black cat named Rastus and a gorgeous yellow canary named Lucky form an attachment for each other that was amazing. 
Lucky always enjoyed the freedom of the house. A few appealing peeps from him would bring someone to the, open the door of his cage so that he might fly anywhere he pleased. Sometimes his voice was a perch. His choice, sometimes his choice was a perch on a chandelier, sometimes on the head of the sh or shoulder of a human friend. Sometimes he preferred to take a bath in a water glass on the dinner table or sit on the side of a plate and pick up bits from a vegetable salad. But sooner or later, he would go in search of Rastus. Finding the cat, he would emit a number of happy little notes and light between the two back ears of the cat. Immediately, the cat would begin purring. It was a strange sight to see the two creatures, often enemies, so devoted. At sleepy time in the evening, either the cat or the bird would go to bed without neither the cat or the bird would go to bed without the other. Rastus had appointed himself a big luxurious chair in the parlor. At the right hour he would climb into this chair, but instead of curling up and going to sleep in that wonderful relaxed cat fashion, he would begin a teasing meow. This would continue until Lucky was brought, cage and all, in place near him. Then the ear air would be filled with purrs by Rastus and P until the two fell into a sleep that was enriched by their fine friendship. On a stock farm in a prairie state, a small monkey appeared one day. <clears throat> Nothing was ever learned of his history. Perhaps he had escaped from a circus. Perhaps he had been a pet of some traveler. Whatever was his story, he appeared on this farm riding on the back of a cow. It was something of a shock for the farmer, living far from the country where monkeys grow, to see one suddenly so much at home with his domestic animals. The farm animals seemed to think nothing of it, however. The monkey named Mike, by his new friends, was perfectly at home with cows, horses, pigs, ducks, chickens, and the farm dog. They liked him, and he liked them. In fact, his affection for his animal associates was a source of considerable trouble for the farmer. Mike didn't want these pals of his disturbed. He didn't want the cow to be milked. He didn't want the pigs put in their pen. When the farmer would come to get the pigs from the hickory grove where they were allowed to roam, the monkey would chase them to the far corners of the field. As the farmer approached, Mike would jump on the por at the porkers, screaming and striking at them, sending them far away on the run. And it was not uncommon to see him grab the tail of a running pig, swing himself upon the porker's back, and go riding away Wild West style. Mike stayed on into the winter, sleeping at night on the back of a cow where he would be warm. The farmer took a liking to him and tried to be patient with his many pranks, but some of the things the little monkey did would ex exasperate a saint. So much did Mike object to the farmer milking the cows that frequently he would grab the man's hat and run with it to the top of a tall oak tree. There he would deposit it, wedging it firmly in a crotch. The farmer spent much of his time climbing high after his hat and in other small articles of clothing. When many such annoyances forced him to do so, the man had the monkey taken to a zoo. There Mike was with others of his kind, and no doubt he was telling them many stories about the fine fellows he found at the farm, and now the cruel farmer, and how the cruel farmer would pinch a cow until milk came out. One of the most amusing bits of mothering I have seen was a cat who adopted a family of young ducks. It was strange indeed to see her go along talking in the same tones she would have used with kittens. The ducks waddling along at other, on either side, behind and beneath her. Her worries were intensified when her adopted youngsters quite naturally took to swimming in a little pond while she stood at the edge, held back by her inborn dislike for water, calling to her charges instructions and cautions that fell on deaf ears are these stories that no animal lover will doubt for a moment the ability of these so-called dumb creatures to manifest the highest order of devotion. Of course, most such stories are about those animals nearest us, the domestic or tame ones. But the little wild folks are no different. We cannot see so clearly into their lives, but we see enough to know that the same fine character is there, and that sometimes companionship is so important to them that they do not care to live if it is broken. A hunter, 
walking along the shore of a frozen northern lake, was attracted by the hectic and unsteady flight of a duck. The bird circled about, calling constantly, and did not dart through the sky in the arrow-like style typical of his kind. Besides, it was late for such birds to be in that country. They should have gone south long before. Soon the man discovered what was bothering the duck. On the ice was another duck, probably the mate, and obviously in trouble. The bird would try to fly, but could not rise. The hunter was not a very good sportsman, as events disclosed. Intent only upon getting the duck, he made his way across the ice. As he did, the bird overhead circled low over him, apparently trying to draw his attention. But he went on, reached the helpless bird, and killed it with a stick. As he returned to shore, the other duck came in and landed near him. It made no effort to escape as he ran toward it, but quietly waited for the blow of the stick which ended its life. The man later expressed his regret that he had killed the birds, for he said that most certainly those ducks had refused to be separated even at the cost of their lives. On a backwoods road in a western national park, two rangers were driving along in a car on fire patrol duty. The road, not being graveled or paved, had two very deep ruts in it, cut by automobile wheels. Suddenly, ahead of them, the men saw a big mother rabbit come out of the brush, followed by half a dozen little woolly youngsters. The mother skipped over the road easily, leading the way, but the little ones did not do so well. The rut was too deep and too wide for their tiny jumps. Into it they tumbled, and their troubles began. Time and again they would try to climb the walls of dirt only to fall back. They raced up and down their troublesome trench looking for lower places, but they found none. The rangers had stopped their car to take in the amusing show, but when it seemed sure that the little fellows were not going to get out under their own power, the men left their car and started walking toward the animals, intent on helping them. The, rubber ma the mother rabbit did not understand their move. Suddenly, she appeared in the middle of the road, directly in front of the men, all prepared to fight. She bared her teeth, raced nervously back and forth, and showed plainly that if those men wanted to hurt her babies, they would have to deal with her first. The men stopped in admiration at this display of courage and devotion. In the meantime, the little fellows obviously were inspired by the actions of their gallant mother. By supreme effort, they scratched, kicked, and scrambled out of the rut and ran into the woods. When the brave, Then the brave mother followed them. As the rangers went back to the car, one of them said, I'm glad I saw that in person, for if you had told me about it, I wouldn't have believed you. The other one said he was having a hard time to believe his own eyes. Salt and Pepper lived in fine companionship from the very first. They played together constantly and during the early months at least were inseparable. Of course, they had their little quarrels, which were never serious. So springtime had now ripened into summer. June rains had finished and the long, lazy days and warm nights of July had come to the sanctuary. The protected waters in shallow bays were becoming a spectacle, a speck, were becoming speckled with lily pads, while slender blades of basket grass floated on the surface, pointing the direction of the current. Now, we were seeing the individuality of our porky pets come forth. Salt, although the male was the stay-at-home, the one contented with his island life. He held to the trees close to our cabin, and it was he who was forever calling to us in the middle of the night, or pestering us throughout the day. Pepper, however, had reached a point where she seldom called to us, her attention directed out into the mysterious distance and vastness of the forest. She haunted the far corners of the island, climbed to the dizzy heights in the trees, and at times waded in the shallow waters along the island shores, as if striving to get up enough courage to swim away. Between the two porcupines, there had developed a mental tug of war. Salt was forever coaxing her to the cabin, calling to her and trying to keep her within the sphere of his interest. Sometimes he succeeded in influencing her briefly and bringing her to our doorstep, where they would scuffle as in ba their baby days. But presently, 
Pepper would turn away, sniff the breeze, and start for the deep brush or tall trees. Sometimes she would coax salt away with her, taking him exploring, perhaps to show him how much larger the world was than he had supposed. But he was not, but he was not content to stay away from us for long. Day after day, we watched this contention grow between them. Unquestionably, they wanted the society of each other. Their little grunts of happiness when they were together showed that. But something was reaching out of the wilderness and drawing Pepper while Salt's heart was devoted to the sanctuary. I believe she is hearing the call of the wild, said Jenny one starlit evening, as we watched Pepper astride the low limb of a tree, looking and listening into the silence. Certainly everything about the creature suggested fascinated attention. Her eyes were open wide as if they could see through the darkness, her nostrils working to analyze scents beyond her our kin. We called to her, but she did not respond, nor even look our way. Salt played at our feet, grunted a greeting, and climbed to my shoulder to chew methodically at my head. Whatever the spell that held Pepper, it did not touch Salt. Nature students are sometimes led to wonder if animals do not have abilities unexplained by the action of the five senses as we know them. There is a rich and beautiful veil of mystery between the great drama of nature and ourselves. We human beings may as well be honest and admit that we know very little of the why and wherefore of what we see. We are spectators of marvelous things, but our explanations are only guesses. What impulse compels the migrations of birds and, Im and butterflies? What directs the miraculous flight of the bee? Whence comes the laws from which govern the civilization of ants? What guides the salmon to the river of his birth? A thousand other unanswered questions remind us that our knowledge of such things is little, even though our interest is great. And sometimes we try to dismiss this, these doings of the wild folk by calling it instinct, which is a cover-all word for that which we do not understand. We realized our questions about Pepper would never be answered. Something we knew, not what, was reaching out of the forest or out of her own nature and drawing her away from us. We felt the distance growing between us. Her effort to take salt along was obvious and continuous. So was his effort to hold her back. Some day she is going to leave, said Jenny, in a, a tone of sadness in her voice. Whatever that call may be, it is too strong. It happened sooner than we anticipated. Summer was still young when there came another magic night. The veil of mystery hung over the north country, and the silence that is more than silence reigned everywhere. It was the kind of night where strange things happen. Pepper was restless and excited. She came to the house and ate sparingly of a cookie we gave her. For a brief moment, she played with salt. Then she went up a tree, and he went to sleep. The still night was ideal for canoeing, and Jenny and I sculled our little craft about the north shore of our lake. Half a dozen deer appeared like ghosts at the edge of the water. We saw a beaver, a muskrat, heard a bear, and felt everywhere the charm that enchanted the forest. When we returned to the island, there was a strange and empty feeling about the place. We both felt it. Salt met us at the dock, acting oddly. He talked incessantly, a new note in his voice. The usual things did not please him. I raised him to my shoulder, but he did not wish to remain there, and was not interested in chewing on my head. He followed us to the cabin, but refused to bite the cookie we offered him. Jenny stood looking at him intently for a moment. Do you know, she said, I believe Pepper is gone. We searched the island, looking up trees that had been favorite spots for Pepper, peering about the boathouse and cabin, calling constantly. Salt trailed along with us, adding his call to ours, but the night gave us no answer. There was only the drip of dew, only the rustle of deer mice and dry leaves, only the echoes of our own voices. Salt was most distressed. His little talk became almost a wail. Not a thing he could, we could do gave him the least bit of comfort. Pepper was gone. In vain she had tried to pull him with her, 
but the call which was reaching her heart was one that must be obeyed. She was going in with salt if he would go, without him if he would not. At the moment, he was not ready to give up his attachment to the cabin and his human friends, so she had gone without him. But she had left a most miserable porcupine pal behind her. It was because of Salt's unhappiness that we continued our search. We felt no concern about Pepper. In fact, we had hoped both porkies would lead normal lives, that they would take to the forest, remembering us only sufficiently to permit us to keep account of them. We thought that the parting would be easy, that we could see them swim away and have perfect contentment in the thought of them living naturally. But we had not figured that one would be left behind so torn with loneliness that it troubled our hearts. We showered salt with condolences, but it did no good. Our petting and caresses were not what he wanted. I presume a porcupine cannot cry tears, but there were tears in Salt's voice, if not in his eyes. We could scarcely stand his grief. Out we went in our canoe, determined to bring Pepper back if possible. We cruised the shores of the lake, not knowing what direction she might have gone, calling constantly, but never a reply did we get, except from an old blue heron whom we disturbed. He flew up and over our heads, telling us a few things which fortunately we did not understand. We landed on the mainland and walked the trails, calling for Pepper in both both. English and porcupinese. As we neared the salt lick, a porky voice answered us. Excitedly, we turned a flashlight in the direction of the call. There stood old Inky, looking at us with his shoe button now eyes. Hi, kids, he seemed to say. What's being baked, boiled, fried, or broiled? Inky boy, pepper is gone, I said, moving toward him. Have you seen anything of her? "'You know everything, Inky. Where is Pepper?' Jenny added, dropping to the ground near him. Inky moved slowly toward me, a step at a time, until I touched him with my hand, and then suddenly he became tough and started whirling around. "'Inky,' I said, a bit hurt, "'this is no time for play. We need your help. Pepper is gone. We can't find her anywhere.' He looked up at me as if to say, "'So what? That's no loss.' Yes, but Inky, it's serious. Salt is over there on the island with his heart broken. Ah, balsam juice. Inky was tougher than, then, than ever. Don't get so riled up about those sentimental young upstarts. They can figure it out for themselves. They aren't handicapped like you human beings. The only way you get any news is by talking or writing, hearing or seeing something. Those young pals don't amount to much, but they are smarter than you are. Let him alone. What if Salt is lonesome? It's good for him. He'll hear from Pepper some day, and in a way that you couldn't understand. He'll be pulling out himself pretty soon, and I wouldn't be surprised if both of them chisel on a on chisel in on my salt lick. We were quiet while Inky continued waltzing around. Suddenly he looked up. Looks as if he were sorry for us now, said Jenny. Yes, it did. Inky looked serious, almost apologetic. He rose on his hind legs, shook out his great coat of quills, and looked the words. Ah, I suppose I'm too tough on you folks. I don't mean to be, but you human beings seem to be so stupid. You've been leaning on different kinds of crutches so long you have lost some of your natural ability. You don't know how to feel things. You can't look out into the night and just know what is going on. You don't listen to the little voices inside yourself that will tell you everything you ought to know. I understand you human beings haven't always been so stupid. You used to be smarter than you are now. You had what you call instincts, as we do. Maybe you had... Intuition, too. I don't know. But you don't have to be responsible for us. We can take care of ourselves. Pepper will know where to go and when to come back. Something inside her will tell her. And as for the whimpering young wimp over on the uh, island, I'd like to give him an extra quill with my compliments. And Inky flew into another spasm of toughness. But Inky, said Jenny, salt is miserable. We just have to take Pepper back to him. Ah, balsam juice, said Inky, and he walked off into the night. And that is the end of chapter six. 
Tune in tomorrow, and Aunt Nikki will bring you chapter number seven from Too Much Salt and Pepper. All right, you guys have a great day, and we will see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.